today's session, session seven, we're going to be looking at the whole issue of networks and networking. The idea of productivity in the workplace is really being brought to question through the results of this new technology. But we're going to look at it today from a perspective of how networks and networking can really contribute to it. Before we do that, we're going to look at a very interesting clip that Novell has put together that deals very specifically with that issue. Let's look at that clip. and the way you do business is changing. Companies that fail to adapt to change will vanish. Well, Barry, that was a pretty interesting clip. Can you please tell us how you think that illustrates some of the problems dealing with uh, productivity and networks? I think what, uh, what it was trying to show uh, with, the, with the different uh, contrasting clips there was that the technology over time has changed drastically. Uh, we don't have a lot of typewriters in the workplace anymore. We have uh, PCs and laser printers. Uh, we don't have uh, the old style uh, telephones and telegraph anymore. We have uh, cellular phones. And the way we do business is a lot different. Uh, people are using all of these tools to gain a competitive edge in the marketplace. And I think what Novell was trying to show is the use of these tools, I think, gives you a competitive advantage in the, mar in the marketplace. And those companies that don't use them may not be as competitive or may cease to exist. Well, that was certainly the point of that clip. And it, it did a pretty good job at showing how the office was cleared out in a hurry. Well, the networking industry as a whole is, has really taken off in, in uh, the last couple of years. And, and it really, I think, uh, there's a lot of uh, question about uh, how it's contributing to productivity, how it's uh, making the uh, workplace more efficient, more effective. But there, there certainly is one thing that's true, is that people are really taking to, to developing local area networks. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's pretty important if we're going to uh, be able to talk to one another in the future, isn't it? Well, that's one of the, the good assets in, uh, in uh, the local area network. Uh, area is uh, the community, the ability to be able to communicate over the local area network. Before we had uh, uh, the standalone PCs, where uh, if we had to communicate with each other, we either had to talk on the telephone, or we had to uh, copy something onto a floppy disk and bring that over uh, to to someone else's at another workstation and have them put that floppy disk in and and read it, etc. So I think it's really uh, um, brought that uh, a lot more effectively into the workplace and, and I think increased the amount of communication in the workplace. Barry, I think that today what we're going to do to try to give our audience a real good sense of what's happening with networks and networking is we're going to look at uh, that whole issue from five perspectives. Let's give our audience the context first, looking at uh, some of the, the kinds of things that are happening, the uh, trends, some of the major players. Uh, then let's go on to uh, look at what the real future will be in, in terms of how a corporation that's really doing something to make it all happen, that is AT&T, uh, really conceptualizes it. Uh, let's look at it from some of the dominant issues that are out there and some of the important things that are occurring. And we, uh, I understand we have with us uh, uh, a World Bank uh, 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 individual who really understands this, uh, this whole issue. Then I'd like uh, us to take a look at it from the kinds of things that are happening at the uh, universities. And uh, there we're going to have uh, Don Stewart, who is the Associate Director of Telecommunications, come in and talk about just a few of the things that 
George Washington University is doing that other universities are, are probably doing as well. And then in our wrap-up, let's look at a couple of very important issues. Let's look at the needs for lands to see if we really, do we really need a land. Let's look at uh, some of the considerations in planning for lands. And let's also uh, take a look at some of the barriers. Okay. Well, let's, uh, let's get over to, uh, to, to putting this whole into, into context. Okay. And let's go to the first slide, or, or the next slide here, uh, that has some of the basic uh, information about the networking and networking in the industry. Uh, as you know, um, it's been projected that 80% of the business computers uh, in, in 1997 are going to be networked computers. So I think that we can see definitely a strong trend towards connecting uh, the business desktops uh, together. Barry, when uh, we do say business computers, but isn't this equally uh, as uh, significant for uh, education, universities, for uh, the offices there, but also classrooms and schools throughout the country? Well, I consider businesses uh, also to include education, the education industry. In, uh, in Fairfax County uh, Public Schools, we have uh, well over 250 individual local area networks uh, scattered throughout the uh, school system. I talked last night with uh, Vicki Sear mm -hmm. out in D uh, Denver, Colorado, who is very interested in setting up uh, uh, a learning resource uh, configuration in a library as part of her strategic management plan, uh, one that's going to be entirely networked. Uh, it's a pretty interesting concept if it also fits within this kind of a setting as well as it does the business environment. Well, a lot of the libraries out there are getting networked, uh, sharing information. So I think that, that that's a strong tennis trend that's also going to continue. Uh, the PC land marketplace is projected to be a 20, over a $22 billion industry by 1998. So you've got a large investment uh, out there from a lot of companies uh, to build up that market, to provide the products and the services uh, to, to, the, to the companies, to the consumers out there, to really, uh, I think, you know, lend a, a credibility to the fact that 80% uh, of those computers are going to be networked. You know, Barry, I just hope that when uh, all of the new uh, local area networking uh, hardware, software, and, and strategies come into place, that the, uh, lo the uh, various companies and universities and schools will really take into consideration long-term planning, that it won't be a, a, a window type of, uh, of upgrade where they just bring something in and uh, and just sort of sit on it. I hope that they've planned it all out and can spread that, their investment cost, uh, out over an extended period of time to keep ahead of, or at least up with the technology. Well, I think we've seen uh, with a number of the different speakers that we've had on the show that e I think everyone agrees that it's going to be an evolutionary process. No one out there has the, the resources to turn their whole uh, business upside down by, put, by uh, upgrading everything up to the latest and greatest PC, putting the latest and greatest uh, uh, cabling or communication infrastructure out there all in a day or a week or a month or even a year. Uh, I think it is going to be an evolutionary process where they upgrade the machines as they go uh, to, um, to make it the most you know, productive environment that they can. Uh, Barry, the, the point I'm, I'd like to make here is that uh, we can handle the technology upgrades. What I'm really concerned about is that we really look at what the needs that people have in these environments, and we look at their problems and their concerns, and that we build everything else against those particular needs. Well, I think that that is the number one uh, requirement when you do any, uh, any type of purchase uh, in a business environment, is to take into account what the customer or what the user wants or needs or requires in order to be more efficient or more effective or more productive. And uh, especially in, in a land environment, uh, you've got to actually you're you're trying to target a larger group of people, so you really have to have all of your ducks in the ro in a row uh, before you actually go out there and acquire something mm -hmm. that you think is going to meet their needs. You know, we've seen over time though that with the local area network uh, environment, you know, that's starting to take off, and uh, there's a lot more computing power on the desktop now than there, than there ever was before. Sure. Um, the mainframe applications are being taken off of mainframes and moved down to the local area networks. So we're seeing a decrease in the, in the number of terminals out there, decrease in the number of mainframe uh, computing power that, uh, right. that people are putting on the market, and an increase in the, in the applications that are being put on the, uh, on the desktop. 
So there's a, there's a large investment in, in there to be able to do that. But before anybody does that, I agree, they've got to be able to take into, into account uh, the requirements of the organization or the requirements of themselves uh, before they buy that. You mentioned that uh, Windows software is, uh, is uh, really starting to dominate the market. And at the same time that that's happening, the dumb terminal uh, market is also beginning to shrink. What, what are the implications of this for the whole future of networking? Well, uh, again, I think, with the, I think that things are being moved off of the mainframes mm -hmm. um, into the desktop, into the local area network environment. Now, not all applications. I think that there are still a lot of applications out there that are appropriate for the mainframe. Uh, but some of the ones uh, that, that are more appropriate for a local area network environment are being moved on to them. So I think you'll see the number of, uh, of terminals uh, decrease out there uh, because the, obviously the desktop has a lot more versatility out there. Uh, the reason I put the, the Windows software starting to dominate the market is, is that really has some serious implications. Uh, before, we had a very command-driven uh, environment for the PCs out there. And now we're starting to see a lot more graphical user interface or GUI as they call it, right. uh, out there, which has got some really different implications out there in the marketplace in terms of training, in terms of support, in terms of application development, in terms of uh, the use of, the, of all the different applications out there. And, and that has to be taken into, into, into the whole mix of the uh, networking environment. Let's look at uh, some trends that are out there. Okay. Um, and, and trends, I mean, what are, what are people doing with networks? What are people asking of networks? What are people um, uh, being involved out there with that? Uh, they're definitely using more technologies than when they originally uh, put up local area networks a while ago. There's more end users out there. We've seen the, the networking environment grow tremendously over the last couple of years. Uh, there are more desktops out there connected to networks today than there was five years, definitely five years ago, and there are going to be more in five years than there were today. Uh, as I said, they're taking some of the mission-critical applications off of the mainframe right. and pushing those down to the local area network And that's a trend that's really going to continue. I think so. I think so. And, and I think it, eventually it'll level off. But uh, I think that the computers have become much more powerful now uh, than they ever were before. And it's appropriate to be able to distribute those applications out across a network or, or, or down to a file server level, PC file server level, uh, so that it doesn't impact the, uh, the processing uh, on the mainframe. Uh, you're going to have, obviously, more networked environments, uh, as we've seen. The, the industry is continuing to grow and will grow for, for some time to come. Um, now, that's, that's kind of the plus side. Uh, you know, it's kind of a rosy picture. You know, everything's growing. Uh, uh, more applications are being developed out there. We've got this graphical user interface uh, that people are, are starting to use. So they don't have to type in commands, et cetera. But kind of the flip side on that, which um, we're going to get into a little bit when we talk to, uh, to Mr. McDonald Buck from the World Bank, is the, the support issues that are created out there. Um, networks don't take care of themselves. And uh, the support issues that are created by Windows, that are created by all the different stuff that we have included in that network is significant. And, and I think that people are going to, gonna, that's kind of the hidden cost out there for the local area network environment. Mm -hmm. And it's not just for the Windows software out there. It's also now for everything else that's included in that, uh, in that uh, configuration on the local area networks. Are these trends that you've uh, pointed out to us uh, fairly well endemic within what's in the emerging field of uh, networks and networking? I think so. I think that these are the these trends. I think are going to continue, um, and I think they're going to continue for a while. And once once they go through that type of uh, of change, once people get used to the technology, once you've saturated the market with the end users and the technology out there, some of these are going to lessen. Some of them may grow a little bit more prevalent. Um, you know, certainly. Uh, the, you, you're not going to see any end, at least to the discussion of what the trends are out there. And there may be some change or some reversals, but all the issues are still going to be out there, I think, five years from now. Some may be, have more emphasis than others. Barry, is there going to be a universal uh, a strategy for planning this stuff so that as this is uh, put together, uh, someone can have sort of a model for how the network ought to work in a given setting? Is that becoming more and more possible, or, or, or is everything 
so need driven or uh, that everything's going to have to be customized for a given location what's your judgment on that given uh, these trends I think uh, to a certain extent uh, you're going to be able to go through the basic steps in, in the planning process and the basic steps in the support process and the basic steps of the implementation process mm -hmm. but again you'll be able to look at that basic model but you're going to have to customize it because every industry and and to the to a certain extent every different business out there uh, is operating under different rules or different environments or with different competitors or with different uh, politics involved or different uh, uh, you know uh, acquisition methods out there mm -hmm. um, and those all have to be taken into account when you go through the whole planning process That's interesting. so I, I really to a certain extent yes I think that the basic shell out there is going to exist but uh, you're going to have to really understand a lot about how your organization works and its requirements in an industry to really be able to fine-tune that model to really make it effective. So you're really pressing in one sense for the case of a very careful customization no matter what the setting. I wouldn't say very careful customization because in some cases you may be able to go with that basic model um, you know pretty much as is but you certainly have to look at if you need to customize it and, and that's where the difference is. You may not have to customize but you certainly have to look very carefully mm -hmm to see if that model is going to meet your needs. Mm -hmm. And if it isn't, then you're going to have to adjust that model to make it, make it more effective in your setting. Perry, you talk about uh, what you consider to be some of the major land players. You want to talk <laughs> about that? Because no, I don't. Uh, this is the, probably the most con controversial slide we have up there. Um, and, and basically what I'm talking about here is, an, is the server end of the, of the market, uh, you know, the number of uh, servers out there by percentage. And uh, I don't think that anyone will argue that right now, especially in the microcomputer uh, area, that Novell has the lead in terms of the, uh, the number of, uh, of servers that are out there. Um, I think we get into a little bit more of a discussion about, by 1997, uh, how much of a market they're going to have and what the distribution of the other players in that market is going to be. You know, Barry, I think in order to really make sense of this, uh, this idea in this slide uh, I would have to we maybe would have to break it down by uh, software by uh, different types of lands uh, by uh, as you say whether it's a server they're talking about or some other mechanism within it but I just want you to I want to make it clear to you that I uh, but when we use the word players I just don't agree with where this is all headed from what I consider to be where the field is headed well I I, I don't agree completely with the slide either but I think that what, what the intent of this is to show that A, Novell is a major player out there. Um, B, is that there are a number of players out there and the contention is really going to be, you know, what part of the market are they going to be in and, and this, is, this whole thing is going to evolve. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, software and hardware and, and services are kind of intangible terms right now and what they're going to be in 1997, who knows? Well, I it's uh, it's an interesting perspective, Barry. It, it, it surely is. I just hope that uh, all these things do come to pass, as and and that people are be become more productive as a result of it. What we need to do now is let's see what it is going to be in the future. Sounds like a good idea. And how are we going to do that? Well, let's look at a tape uh, that AT and T put out. That will tell us about the future. Absolutely. Let's do that. All right. How are you, my 
घर जा रही हो जी श्री नैन मैं घर जा रही हूँ आपने ग्लैन खेम पीटर को खो बताया है और अब मैं आपने माता पीटर को बताने जा रहे हूँ Uh, I'm sure they would be delighted to learn of your engagement to such a fine man. I'm not so sure about that. My dad still thinks I'm a little girl. Well, sometimes I think he's still stuck in the 1990s. This morning, Lata began grinding the roots for the colors you've selected. I know a year is a long time to wait, but this will be a very special carpet. It's going to be our belated wedding gift to each other. I am honored that the two of you met in my shop. A handsome young doctor from Belgium and a beautiful scientist from America. You did much for our village, and I wish you a lifetime of love, my children. Stay back at home. Stay back at home. Stay back at home. Store image. Render building. Show new plans. Show new exterior. Answer call. Hi, sweetheart. Ian, would you mind picking me up at my office instead of at home? I've got something I need to finish up. You want me to swing by and pick up Zach? No, he's playing with some friends. Oh, honey, I'm so excited. It's been almost four months. Uh, I'll see you in about an hour. What do you want? I want to show you this. What is it? A court order. You and your group have to leave. Perhaps eventually. But it says here that your wrecking crews may not touch this building for 30 days. That means, Mr. Harrison Adams, that we have 30 days to present our case to the city planner's office. 30 days to save Bassett Hall. And we will save it. I don't understand why you're so against new housing here. We have adequate housing in this neighborhood, thank God. But what we need is a, a community center where... Who are you, anyhow? I'm the deputy city planner. System, whole heroes and horrors. So, Zach, you can't quit just when I'm about to bite your neck. That's worth 500 points. I got a message. I gotta put you guys on hold. Network calls on hold. System, message, please. Zach, if this message appears, you've spent more than an hour playing a game, and you know the limits we agreed on, sweetie. So finish up right away, and if you want to stay on the system, then switch to virtual homework, okay? Release hold on calls. Mommy checking up on you, Zachary? Kara, I'm gonna clobber you. We'll see. You ready to start? Yeah. Resume heroes and horrors. <laughs> Kara? Jamie? Uh, it's getting late here. I gotta do homework. Goodbye. Mommy, Dad, oh, I missed you guys too much. Oh, my Dad. Girl, oh. Oh, mm -hmm. oh I'm so glad you home. So Look, I forgot. I brought you some. <laughs> For your collection. Oh. It's a mountain climbing bear. He's so cute. <laughs> Baggage claims this way. Yeah, Daddy, but the phones are this way, and I told somebody I'd call as soon as I touched down. Hmm. Well, you'll see. Will you hold this? Just for one second. <laughs> Good afternoon, Ms. McFarland. Please verify your identity by saying the random word stepladder. Stepladder. How may we help you? Glenn, please. Glenn Carson or Glenn Devereaux? Devereaux. He's at his parents' home and has left word to connect you there. Who are you calling? Daddy, shh. Thank you for using AT&T. Bonjour, Lily. Bonjour, Madame Devereux. Un mon, mon chéri. Who's this woman? Daddy, please. There's somebody I want you to meet. Ma chérie. Ça fait je suis terre, mais c'est comme une année. Monsieur McFarland, je suis Glenn Devereux, le fiancé de votre fille. What did he say? J'ai dit avec beaucoup de fierté et amour, Monsieur McFarland. Mm -hmm that I am the fiancé of your beautiful daughter. And if I may, Mr. McFarland, I would be honored to call you Dad. Dad. She marries this boy, she's out of here. She's not living in this house anymore. I agree with you. You do? Sure. When she marries Glenn, she won't be living in this house anymore. Very funny. <laughs> Answer call. Your consultation is ready, Anne. 
All connections have been made. Sydney, do we have full enterprise set up? Yes, Anne. Lauren Williams, the patient, and a technician are in Orem, Utah at the scanner. Lauren's specialist, Dr. Lyle, is at her office in Boston. Wu Corporation's computer-aided design center is online from Seoul, and two of Mr. Wu's suppliers are on standby. Mr. Wu, however, is fishing in Mongolia and has taken himself off the network. His intelligent agent, Mr. Park, will handle the call. I'll take it in the other room. Sydney. Yes, Ian. Why did my wife design a computerized intelligent agent to be so young and handsome? I am sorry, Ian. I am not permitted to respond to that question. Well, that's smart, Sydney. But I do thank you for the compliment. Mr. Park, please display unit cost as I change design parameters on the CAD. Only Mr. Wu can authorize cost displays with a patient online. I can, however, run retail figures. That'll be fine. Dr. Lyle, we could do a holograph of the leg, maybe polymerize a new prosthesis socket. And I really think we're going to have to make some changes in the prosthesis itself. It's not allowing her to drop to her knees the way a goalie needs to without experiencing quite a lot of pain. Maybe we could leave the socket alone. Cad, show me an 18% increase in surface elasticity. Sydney, put Lauren's scan on screen. Lauren, your musculature has changed dramatically in the last three months. I've been training really hard, Miss McFarlane, for the Junior League Hockey Championships in Helsinki. Helsinki? Can remeasure and give me figures of the present socket design executed in a less temperature sensitive cup Hi, Lily. How are you? Oh, it's beautiful. Thanks. Go right on in. She's expecting you. Okay, thanks. Mr. Wu has forwarded the cost figures for the changes in Lauren Williams' prosthesis. They are in line with our estimates, but he has allowed a 12% discount. A discount? He loves hockey. <laughs> we'll pass the savings to the Williams Insurance Company, then retransmit the video mail we got of Lauren's hockey finals in Helsinki to Wu. He should get a real kick out of that. <laughs> hi, Mom. Oh, hi, honey. Come on in. Are you ready to go shopping? We're all set. Oh, mm -hmm. great. Sit down. Sydney, lunchtime. Uh, please order us two cop salads from Ronnie's. Okay, sounds great. Also, put us online with Colton's bridal service. <laughs> Lily, please authorize your electronic mannequin. Open clothing file, transmit mannequin, Lily, white tunic and heels. Now here's the basic dress. Can I see what it would look like if it was just a little shorter? Shorter? <laughs> Only in the front, Mom. Okay. How's this? I think maybe it's just a little too showy. Yeah, definitely. There is one type of dress that I'd really like to see. It's um, a retro look, something that they might have worn in the 1920s. OK, let me suggest this one. Can I see a cloche hat with that and, um, and a veil? And show me a bouquet just for the heck of it. <laughs> Do you <want> <laughs> Thank you for coming. I didn't think you would after the way I spoke to you the other day. Don't worry about that. I didn't come with any good news, though, Ms. Ortiz. I, I came because the material you sent me showed a lot of caring and concern. I want to show you something. This is an electronic classroom. When we link to the Education Center in Washington, D.C., we have in this school the very best teachers. And although they are computer generated, they can interact with each student individually at his or her level, providing that special help exactly when and where it's needed. Not all the children in this neighborhood get that kind of attention at home. That's why it's become so very important for us to establish a community center. Of course you didn't help her. There's nothing you could do anyhow. What's that? It's a presentation Anita Ortiz and her group prepared. Not interested. It's too late. And it's over. 
The court order expires tonight at midnight, and tomorrow Bassett Hall comes down. Lily's wedding day. Jitters, I guess. Yeah, me too. Oh. I know. It's a lot of things, Lily. Last few days, I've sort of taken stock of who I am, and I realized that I, I always used to be a guy who tried to do what was best. Now I do what's safe. I was upset about your marriage because I didn't want you to take any risks. All I know, Daddy, is that I love Glenn. But I feel strongly enough about it that I'm willing to take that chance. And I'll never regret accepting whatever risk there might have been in taking a stand. Says some give me Harrison Adams. He is at the office, but has told the network to hold all calls. Would you care to record a message? He's still at his office? Cancel the call. Call canceled. Harrison? I got two things to say to you. One. What makes you think you know more about what's right for a community than the people that live in it? Two, you are about as bullheaded an individual as I have ever met. Bullheaded? <laughs> well, Ian, when you're right, you're right. Right, Mrs. Ortiz? Mrs. Ortiz? What's going on? What's going on is I read a presentation, and you were right. It is good. Now, that still doesn't make me wrong about this community center business. But the demolition is still on hold. I got the surprise of my life last night when Mr. Adams called and asked me to come down here. I sent Marsh, my intelligence agent, to hit a lot of databases all over the world. I asked him to develop new recommendations for the Bassett Hall property based on a building with 20 housing units, incorporating space for recreation, and a community center. He found 10 such buildings on elevations identical to what we've got downtown. He even got permission to access our lenders database and the tax office. Well, what can I do to help? Uh, nothing. Not right now, anyhow. Because I've got more important things for us to do. More important? Like what? Like going home, showering, shaving, putting on some fancy duds, and showing up at your daughter's wedding. Lily, Glenn. Ah, Shri Nan. Colleen, Aga, hey. Hum, aapko the kanta chate hai. There's something else we want to show you too, Shri Nan. <laughs> oh, Lily. He's so beautiful. Baby's kind of cute too, don't you think? You know, Barry, that was uh, quite impressive. Uh, when I uh, yeah, but I don't I don't believe a word of it. So I, I don't think that that'll happen. Well, I understand your feeling, and I had the same feelings before I talked to the people at AT and T when I was getting permission to uh, show this clip. And I asked uh, the uh, people there whether or not the things that they were uh, on the tape were real, and and how soon they would come into the market. Uh, the answer is, uh, these are all being developed now and in, in, in production uh, in the laboratory setting uh, by AT&T and its subsidiaries. Uh, the question, how long will it reach the market, is a different type of question. But there seems to be a number of things that, that need to occur and a number of technologies that have to be evident before this type of uh, networking can really take place. Well, I think that it also has to reach critical mass. It has to just not be available for the individual to use, but it has to be available for lots and lots of people. As that clip showed, you know, they were interacting with a lot of different um, 
places right there, are people right there. And so uh, you've got to be, reach critical mass, I think, also in that area. What kinds of uh, characteristics will, uh, in the technology, will need to be out there for this uh, type of uh, productivity? Uh, networking to, to really have an impact. Well, I'm glad you asked that, because I right. happen to have a slide on that. Okay. And, and if we could see that now, um, basically uh, all of all the things indicated on the slide there have to uh, occur, or I'm not going to say have to occur, but to get that kind of, uh, that kind of quality and diversity out there uh, have to occur. We saw from Intel, their, uh, their ProShare product had a lot of the capabilities that, uh, that AT&T was talking about here. The interactive video, and uh, displaying multiple uh, objects up on the screen, et cetera. So I think that technology is, is coming into the market now, but that kind of seamless technology, I think you're right, is actually out there a little bit. I think when both Intel and Digital Equipment Corporation made their presentations, uh, they, they did so with the idea of being able to show motion and voice at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, that's where this is really headed, isn't it? Well, I think not only mo motion and voice, but also the data there to support it. And um, I think it's getting there. It's coming along. Uh, again, everything, everything we've talked about, uh, we always keep saying the word evolution. Uh, and I think that this is another evolutionary step in, in going through that. Uh, before, we just had data. And uh, we're going to show a little bit later in some of the other sessions uh, some products that just uh, put data between two PCs. Um, and, and now with Intel's ProShare product and a lot of other products that are coming out there, uh, you've got now the, the voice and the uh, video and the data. And I think what AT&T was trying to show that somewhere down the road, you're going to be you know, having a lot more smooth uh, transition between all those different components and also uh, have it be more seamless. The one thing that I really liked uh, in the show was being able to have speech recognition uh, almost, it's almost simultaneous uh, mm -hmm. with people talking uh, all the way across the world. Yeah, and, and have it translate for you right on the spot. I, like, I, I like that. Well, let's, let's jump a little bit back into, uh, into the present right now. Okay. Uh, because uh, I had a uh, fascinating, uh, or am going to have a fascinating discussion, I'm sure, with uh, Mr. McDonald Buck, who is uh, with the World Bank. And uh, we're going to be talking about uh, some, of the, some of the current issues in uh, networks and networking. I look forward to that discussion. With us today we have uh, Mr. McDonald Buck from the World Bank and he's going to be talking to us a little bit about uh, the issues in uh, networking and networks. Thank you for coming today. Nice to be here. Tell us a little bit about the uh, networks, uh, the LANs and the WANs at the World Bank. Well, of course, we have a wide variety of different kinds of networks. Uh, we have to deal with 60 or 70 internationally located field offices, typically in the developing world, as well as uh, probably in the neighborhood of 12,000 workstations of various kinds located here in Washington, D.C. We also have a substantial legacy network uh, surrounding mainframes and uh, older technology. We have uh, a substantial voice network in addition. Um, consider all of these to be a part of the same enterprise-wide network for the World Bank. Now, does it, does it all work together? Not as well as we'd like, <laughs> but we're working on that. I, I think integrating voice and data, for example, is still uh, an elusive goal. Um, we still have quite a lot of difficulty in getting network uh, extended to parts of the developing world where the telecommunications infrastructure is not very good still, uh, particularly in places like Sub-Saharan Africa and, and uh, Asia. Well, the current way we do that now, uh, uh, you know, locally is we strap cables along, uh, you know, fiber optic, uh, shielded twisted pair, uh, coax, et cetera. How do you do it in places where you can't just string a cable through the desert? Well, in places where we are trying to, uh, to bring bandwidth to field offices, we are experimenting with uh, technologies which are new to us, um, VSAT uh, 
satellite links to uh, field offices to replace existing uh, voice-based, largely voice-based technologies. Uh, actually, a lot of what we need to do is to improve the voice communications and fax communications. Data communications is a, is a lower priority for most of these places. Although, interestingly, since many of them are in time zones where they overlap with headquarters uh, uh, office hours is small, still we have a lot of voice traffic. Yet, uh, implementing even a small amount of data bandwidth enables us to use electronic mail, which has a very uh, interesting effect on the way that we can share work between the field office and headquarters. What, um, how does email work? Uh, in, in terms of that, I mean, how do you get more productivity out of using that email? Well, we've uh, found that in many cases, in some of the field offices where reports are under preparation, we're able to uh, get in effect a second shift from some of the uh, workers in the field office. People working here in headquarters can work during the day on uh, a forestry project and then uh, send the results of their analysis out to the field office where further analysis from the field can be added during what is our night and their day. Uh, it's a very interesting way of improving productivity. The World Bank is, is basically a global enterprise. You've got, you've got lands all over, the, all over the world. Well, uh, not yet. We, okay. In many of our field offices, we are um, moving towards using local area networks for the kinds of local productivity improvements that you get from them, file and print services and that kind of thing. Most of what we have today in the remote locations is electronic mail mm -hmm. and a lot of standalone PCs. Mm -hmm. um, we have quite a lot of local area network connectivity inside the headquarters uh, of the bank. We have probably four to 5,000 uh, network nodes uh, interconnected with a variety of different commercial land products. But of course the problems for us are a little different than simply local area networks. The commercial land products typically focus on small scale enterprises where most of the work is focused around the PC and uh, being able to create documents and share them, uh, print them, and do a little basic electronic mail. In an organization with uh, 10 to 12,000 workstations where the work is not organized in uh, along organizational boundaries necessarily, there's a great deal of need to exchange information across wider uh, organizational scope. And in addition, there's a great deal of need for access to information off of non-PC type information environments, Unix, IBM, uh, mainframes. And so we find ourselves having to solve a little bit different problem in which the sort of commercial local area network products play a role, an important role, but can't provide the total answer. I understand that a lot of your viewers are interested in uh, a, uh, a smaller office uh, scale in which a local area network is very appropriate. Yeah, a lot of, uh, a lot of the, the, I guess, uh, the people that are, that are just starting to get into the uh, local area network environment um, there are really two different kinds of people. There are the people that have nothing, maybe some standalone PCs, and now they're working at trying to get them all together. And then there's the other kind of person who maybe has a legacy system, uh, a mainframe and some terminals, and now they're just starting to get PCs out there and they're grappling with, you know, how to, how to connect all that stuff together. That's a, that last is a, is a difficult problem because the kinds of solutions available in the first scenario you painted are very strong and useful, but they don't lend themselves quite so well to bridging the gap, uh, in my experience. For people who are just starting out, the commercial land products are a really excellent solution for tying uh, personal computers together, and they provide a lot of advantages and productivity, although the problems typically that people run into are not technological problems. Most of the problems are human, psychological, sociological problems, changes in people's behavior, the difficulties of uh, supporting these kinds of... Well, we're we're going to get into that in just a minute. 
Uh, but but getting back to the the uh, local area networks, all right? We local area networks with PCs, you agree, is pretty much. I mean, I'm not going to say straightforward, but the the products are available, and it, you can go out there and do it. With with the mainframe side of it, you've got mainframe thrown into the equation now. Or several. Or several mainframes, maybe different brands of mainframes out there. One, I guess one of the complaints we've heard is that it's kind of a the, 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 the seamless integration really isn't there. Have you found that to be true? That's quite true. Uh, typically, what you find is that the uh, organizations who are trying to grapple with this problem are coming from a legacy environment in which the desktop device of choice has been a dumb terminal. And so the classical way of dealing with this problem is to provide what's called terminal emulation. That is to say, to take your two to $5,000 PC and turn it into a $500 terminal. <laughs> uh, it's not a good way to get maximum advantage from the power of the desktop appliance, but it is a good way to provide the, the desk-based worker with the same kind of access to the legacy applications that he or she has had in the past. What one misses, though, is the opportunity to couple the desktop productivity tools, the spreadsheets and word processors, electronic mail, with the kinds of uh, institutional in information that's that's locked away in the mainframes, which is where a lot of the real productivity would come from. Is that coming down the road, do you say? I believe in large measure it is. Um, I believe that the mainframe manufacturers are uh, bowing to the inexorable pressure of industry to take better advantage of the power of these desktop devices and the investment that American business has made into them. Uh, and furthermore, I think they're looking for a way to um, to have some role for these mainframes to play in the future world. They they have many advantages, and one of the advantages is that there is a lot of corporate data located on these machines. How can we bridge the gap between local networking and these these uh, historical applications? Let's talk a, a second about uh, support issues. Um, one, uh, one of the biggest, uh, I guess, hidden costs uh, in a local area network or uh, integrating mainframes and PCs is, is the support issue. Talk about how, uh, how a person deals with that and, and exactly what those issues are. Well, I can talk more about the, what the issues are than about how one solves them. They're very <laughs> difficult to solve. Um, one of the things that I think is important is that people who are contemplating installing networking need to understand that while it's a very seductive idea that the next logical step from from standalone PCs is to is to put together uh, the PCs with uh, networking people need to understand that the kinds of issues that you face in networking are quite different and uh, much more complex than the kinds of issues you face with standalone PCs um, that said, the, the advantages you get from it are also very important. Many people talk about a multiplier effect, that, uh, that the cost of having local area networks is much higher than the cost of the uh, hardware and software that you have to spend. One mustn't gauge the cost of a networking initiative simply on the strength of uh, a few Ethernet cards and some Novell software. Uh, if you ignore the support aspects of it, you will not get the productivity benefits. Support and training are uh, the two biggest areas of expense for networking initiatives. Now, when you talk about support, um, we're talking about the, the actual hardware maintenance end of it. We're actually also talking about the, the, um, the, all the applications that go, go on there and supporting those kinds of of, uh, well, you've got a lot of different applications out there. And what we're seeing also, I think, is you've got on that solution, you've got a lot of different products from a lot of different vendors mm -hmm. and trying to, you know... Integrate. Integrate them integrate all. Integrate is the word. Um, how do you deal with that? Well, I'll give you some random thoughts. I'm not sure I can give you a coherent answer. Okay. Um, first, I would say that many American businesses are finding that in the networking world, they're having to do a lot of their own integration. Whereas in the past, we have been able to rely on a single vendor 
to do a lot of that integration for us. Uh, this is uh, striking fear in a lot of hearts. It's, it's very difficult to do. Um, well, I leave it at that, I guess. A lot of, a lot of pieces, places are relying on, I guess, their own in-house people to be able to do it now. Whereas before they had an MIS to do it, and now that's kind of delegated out to someone now owns the network in this department and someone that then owns it in this department. And then they've all got to figure out, you know, if it's broken, how do I fix it kind of deal. Is that pretty much what you're saying? I think that the, the challenges that you face in trying to integrate collection of software from different vendors onto a desktop device so that they will operate together and play harmoniously together over a network is a great challenge. And the vendors, by and large, aren't able to solve that problem for you. Mm -hmm. they, they are interested in it, and they've formed uh, innumerable alliances with the objective of trying to be able to play harmoniously together, but we're not there yet. And so the, the local support people find themselves trying to solve the problems that crop up when there is conflict between these applications. Uh, applications up to now have not been able to rely on a ubiquitous infrastructure of uh, well-tested solutions. That's coming, but it's not there yet. Well, yeah. let's, let's say I've got a, uh, a PC that's on a local area network and it breaks. Um, and, and I've got some software on there. If I'm not getting it to work, why can't I just call each one of those vendors and say, okay, here's the problem? Well, first of all, I'm going to challenge the word break. Okay. I don't actually think that, that most of the trouble calls that one gets have to do with something breaking. It has more often to do with it didn't act the way I wanted it to act. Mm -hmm. It didn't do what I thought it would do. I don't know how to do this thing that I'm trying to do. Um, one of the interesting things about the notions of support and training, I think, is that they are almost indistinguishable. Most support is a form of training, in my view. Most of the kinds of support that we find ourselves doing in local area network environments have to do with teaching people how to do things in a network environment, which they may or may not have even known how to do uh, in a standalone environment, but in some cases things that they couldn't do in a standalone environment. Let's talk a second about hardware. Um, can I use my 286 on a local area network? Uh, in your local office environment, in the near term, certainly you can. A lot of... Uh, a lot of issues go away when you when you get away from your 286s and up to at least the 386s. Um, in our own work, uh, we have found that it is not productive for us to put a lot of energy into engineering solutions which operate on those classes of machines, principally because we are interested in solving a as we've said before, a somewhat different kind of problem right. dealing with the legacy systems. A wide variety of different kinds of uh, computing resources that need to be to be integrated together. And so we're not using a, a classically pure local area network solution. In that case, there's no way we can do this with uh, 286s or even the 386SX, so to speak. You need to get up into machines that have uh, uh, <laughs> a sensible amount of memory. <laughs> Um, a little bit more horsepower. Yes, indeed. However, if, uh, if an organization has a collection of 286s and, and 386s and smaller uh, capacity boxes, I wouldn't want to give the impression that you have to go out and replace all of that in order to, to begin to get some of the advantages of tying these machines together. Um, just eliminating the phenomenon that people call uh, sneaker net or Nike net uh, is, is a big advantage, and you can do that with a little netware and uh, or Banyan Vines or uh, Land Manager. A lot of the different, a lot of, uh, there are a lot of vendors out there providing good solutions out there. Very good solutions. Uh, if you had to change one thing about the networking field, if you could change one thing about the networking <laughs> field, what would it be? I think one of the advantages that we see in many other parts of the uh, uh, the corporate space in this country and in the technologically evolved uh, Western world, so to speak, is standards, standardization. And unfortunately, although all of the vendors see the advantages 
I think they truly see it's more than just lip service, the advantages of networks. It is, um, it is hopelessly tempting for them to try to use standardization as a way to gain market advantage. And as a result, we have not got good standardization, as one has in the uh, automobile production industry or the electronics industry. Uh, and, and therefore, we have a lot of people trying to solve problems or second-guess the future standards, second-guess industry directions. Um, and it's too bad that there is so much of the focus on the technology rather than on the business needs. Now, what, what happens if there aren't standards? Uh, chaos. <laughs> <laughs> the kind of world we had with the mainframes. Okay. Quick, uh, just quick answers here. Uh, telecommuting. Uh, it's going to revolutionize business in corporate America soon, but we don't have the telecommunications infrastructure in place yet. ISDN may be the answer, but I still don't know. <laughs> <laughs> if uh, The standard isn't there yet. The standard is there. The, the, um, uh, we're getting a little out of my depth here when we get into to, uh, the idiosyncrasies of the different implementations of ISDN by the, by the baby bells, but my understanding is that we're not quite to the point yet where all of the ISDN implementations can interact. Furthermore, there are a lot of other alternative uh, scenarios on the horizon for bringing higher bandwidth to the home. That's really the key, isn't it? Okay. I, and I, I agree with you. I think that uh, ultimately maybe we'll get that AT&T vision down the road. Uh, I'd like to thank you very much for being here. It is really Glad to be um, here. interesting information. Thank you. In this section of our series today on networks and networking, we're very fortunate to have with us Don Stewart, who is the Associate Director of Telecommunications here at George Washington University. Don and I are going to be talking about the kinds of networking initiatives that George Washington University has been involved over the last couple of years in, and that we feel are important not only for us at George Washington University, but for other universities throughout the United States. Don, before we get started and move into these issues, could you tell us the kind of networking configuration that we have here at George Washington University that has allowed the things you're going to be talking about to really happen effectively? Sure, Reynolds. Uh, back in 1986, when we first put this new telecommunications system together, we started out with a, a network of modems going into uh, ISN, which is a packet switching system. The packet switching system tied all the dormitories together with all the various hosts around campus. These, in turn, were used to get to the internet system. Later on, we decided it was time to expand the system. We had put some fiber in the ground along with the telephone system and we put in FDDI, which is fiber routers. The fiber routers run at 100 megabits per second, which is quite fast. Very, yes. Now, what that has allowed us to do is, from the fiber routers, we've been able to hang Ethernet segments to various departments, and also token ring segments, where people have token ring, to integrate the local area networks into our backbone. This allows us to provide access to our network from anybody who has a modem from off campus, anybody who's directly connected on campus, anybody who has Ethernet or token ring access on campus, or anybody who's directly connected to the backbone. Is the plan in this uh, ongoing strategy to allow all the students and all the faculty to be able to carry out their functions through the network, Don? Yes, that's correct. And in fact, one of the original ideas behind putting this network in place was to put one network connection in every dormitory room so that any student could bring a PC or a Apple or even a dumb terminal, hook it to the network connection and be able to do some computing on campus at some level. So the, the system is based on people being able to get access at various speeds 
depending upon how much equipment they can afford or they have on hand. It sounds like that you went ahead and planned and begun to build a very uh, significant infrastructure to handle all of the uh, oncoming uh, telecommunications and these ventures we're going to talk about today as the first step. Is that, is that correct? That's correct. The first step in any network is laying a good foundation. And in this case, what we tried to do was put in enough infrastructure as far as copper and fiber optics and in the right places so that as the technology advanced, we could take advantage of it without a lot of expense and infrastructure. So you, uh, you came into the university and you laid uh, fiber optic cables to connect this entire uh, uh, system, is that correct? That's correct. This university is 19 city blocks, okay. basically, and we have 88 miles of fiber in the university. And how does that fiber uh, differ from uh, uh, twisted pair and from uh, slower network capabilities? Well, an example of speeds would be the best way to look at that. For instance, a, a plain pair of twisted wires, normally a telephone wire that you have at your house, would be capable of perhaps 14.4 uh, speed with a modem. 14,400 14, baud. Baud with a modem. Mm -hmm. Now, that's, that's a reasonable speed for that. Okay. Its actual speed is, is a little faster, but that's reasonable these days with okay. a high-speed modem. The Ethernet segments we have in place handle 10 megabits. That's 10, 10 million, million bits per second. Right. Mm -hmm. the, the fiber optic system we have in place today, the, the FDDI network is 100 megabits or million bits. Per second. Per second. But the actual bandwidth of the fiber, the availability of the fiber, is 165 megabits or million bits per second. So the, uh, you can have a number of uh, simultaneous uh, transmissions occurring back and forth on the fiber optics at, at one time. That's correct. The, the fiber optic, one fiber optic strand, which is um, as small as a hair, is capable of carrying as many conversations as a large piece of uh, telephone cable about three inches in diameter, 1,900 pairs. But much faster, right, Don? Well, the aggregate bandwidth would be the same, but you can see that if you had to put a piece of cable in, it was about two inches or three inches in diameter all over the place compared to one fiber strand, that, that the weight and the size would be a prohibitive, whereas the fiber is very easy to put in. Mm -hmm. The technology of fiber splicing has improved significantly, and uh, the cost-benefit ratio of fiber is, is gone much better than it used to be. Well, Don, do, do fiber optic cables deteriorate readily in the ground? No, that's the nice thing about fiber, you see. In most cases, the, the old telephone cable you had in your house, if you stayed there for any length of time, you notice the telephone company came out maybe every 20 years and had to replace it because water got into the cable and the copper corroded. Uh, the fiber optic cable doesn't have this problem. You can submerge it. You can stick all sorts of electric fields around it, and it's impervious. However, it's, it's not indestructive. If you bend it enough and you submerge it in water, you can have a little problem with, with fiber infiltration. And what that does is it reduces the bandwidth, but it doesn't wreck it. Don, it, it sounds like uh, George Washington University went through a very extensive uh, strategic management plan in order to put this infrastructure into place with a full knowledge that w of what it wanted to do in the future, which is to make sure that all the faculty all the administrators and all the students would have access, not only from on campus, but also have access off of campus and vice versa. Was that part of your strategic management planning thinking when you did this? Yes, it was. And in fact, this, this plan didn't just arrive. We consulted with everybody on campus who had any input at all. All the computer centers, the medical center, the faculty, the students, everybody had a chance to come in and say what they wanted so that when we, we built the system that everybody's needs would be served. And in fact, there's spare capacity in our manhole system now for the next generation of fiber. Just so you can put more down if so you need we, That's right. We've got multi-mode fiber. The next generation single-mode fiber will run uh, 650 megabits instead of 160 megabits. So you can see that there's, there's a factoring here that uh, you get a lot more speed out of it. But we didn't need that speed at this time, but we did need to put room for it for growth in the future. Don, one of the things that we uh, w was covered in our discussions last week with Digital Equipment Corporation and with, in and with Intel 
was the need for extremely high speed uh, uh, digital transmission where, because they would be doing uh, uh, text conversion and using graphics uh, in a, in a real-time environment. Um, is, is this particular uh, pl strategic management plan that you've laid out, take that type of thing into consideration? Yes, we have. Our, our particular network is capable of doing all these things, the regular data transmission, the imaging systems. The only thing our data system can't do right now is voice. And that's because voice works a little bit differently than data. You can't break up voice into different little packets and send them and reassemble them. Voice has to go together. So the only, the only limitation we have on our system now, our fiber system now, is with digitized voice. How's that working out? Our system is working really good. It is. Um, recent, recently, the routers have been carrying between 3 and 9% of traffic on our 100 megabit backplane. Mm -hmm. So we have plenty of growth available in the system. Well, Don, we've talked about a, a number of very important technical considerations that fit into your strategic management plan in order to allow you to really put together uh, some very important new strategies for the school. And one of them that uh, we, you and I talked about uh, previously was the uh, touchtone registration system. Could, could you just take a couple minutes and talk a little bit about that and how it fit into the overall plan? Sure. One of, one of the first things that we've got a lot of input from was students and touchstone and uh, registration. Okay. The registration process here at the university used to be a long process where you had to stand in line to get advised, then you had to go to a different building to stand in line to get registered, then you had to go to a different building to pay for the classes. Mm -hmm. And this took a lot of time. Usually it took more than an hour for the student to start this process, get advised, and go get paid. Mm -hmm. And the students were really not very happy with this. And it also took a lot of administrative staff time. So one of the first things we looked at when we got our network in place was, is there some better way to do registration? And it turns out there is. We're not the first university to do this. We've installed a touchstone registration system. So basically what, what that means is a student picks up the phone any time of the night or day, dials a number, is connected to a voice response unit. You punch in your student ID and a password, and you instruct the, the system over the telephone using the, the keypad what course you would like. The system responds unless you know if the course is available and if it is, you're registered. A bill is generated automatically and mailed to your house. The, to the total time to do this is about three minutes. This is a significant improvement on okay. the hour. Plus, there are, unless you have a real problem with registration, you never talk to a person. There's never a staff person tied up. If there's a problem, there's a way out of the system to get to a live operator who will work you through your problems. So we've reduced the time to register. We've reduced the number of staff. And I think we've increased the, the students' satisfaction with, with the operation of the administration at the university. Well, Don, let's assume that I was in uh, California in a business meeting. Mm -hmm. and, and, I was, and I was away, and I'm a graduate student. We have a lot of graduate students here at George Washington University, but I had my uh, trusty little uh, modem and, uh, and laptop or, or uh, notebook computer, uh, and it was time to do my registration. Could I do my registration from California? Sure. In fact, you didn't need your laptop. All you needed was a telephone. All you have to do is dial into the regular registration lines. You do have to have your booklet, registration booklet with you, okay. or know what the course numbers are. Because remember, because you're using a keypad on your telephone, it had to be converted from letters to numbers. Okay. So you can dial in any place. If you were in, out of the United States and you knew it was time, you could dial in. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the nice thing about this. If you're at home in, say, Connecticut or in California, and you're not at school, you can register now, and you don't have to be physically here. I could be in France and, and use the telephone and dial in. That's correct. And if you had to make a change, you could do it also. So you can make changes, additions, subtractions, deletions. All the changes you'd have to see somebody for, you can do on the system by yourself. Don, when we uh, first started out, this, this whole thing was uh, just here at George Washington University. I understand that we now have moved to a multi-campus uh, communication to tie together uh, our uh, uh, one campus in Loudoun County 
and and I, I don't know if you have it in other places, but what's the uh, what's the process now that um, that we have available to us so that we can talk to other uh, campuses? Okay, well, here's what usually happens. It, uh, we have another campus in Loudoun County that's right. about two years old, and the people out there have come up with some needs. For instance, when we put them in, we had to get to them to talk. Mm -hmm. It turns out that it's in another ladder. That's a technical telephone term, which means the calls are going to be long distance. Okay. So the first thing we decided was, if they're going to be long distance calls, how are we going to manage the cost of the long distance calls? So we decided to put in a, a small private branch exchange, a small PBX out there for their voice system, and use tie lines to come back to the, to the main campus so we would bypass the long distance charges. And we just play a, fat, a flat rate for the tie lines. And that, that's good for the voice, and that worked out pretty well. And that allowed them to get back to campus. Then they came up with some data requirements, as everybody else has. Right. And we put another ISN packet switch out there okay. and tied that together at campus with a 56 kilobit line. And that worked good for about two years. And then some enterprising people in our television studios decided that maybe we ought to use the video conferencing facility out there. Right. And we got a uh, video conferencing system. And at that point, we couldn't serve the needs of the university out there with the existing system. We added a, a unit called a multiplexer to our, to our uh, voice line, which was mm -hmm. a T1, one and a half million bits per second line. And we dropped our data line, the 56 kilobit line, and on the multiplex, we used voice, data, video, and also we added a security line out there. And by doing this, by putting a little capital up front in the multiplexers at both ends, we were able to save a significant amount of money every month on the rental of the slower speed line. Don, we have uh, something here at GW called the uh, Washington Library Consortium. And in that consortium, it's my understanding that if I'm a student or a faculty member looking for a book and I want to know where that book is, that I can have access to be able to get to that. Is, is that part of our networking uh, prospect here? Yes, it is. And mm, this is happening on networks in, uh, not in networks, but in libraries everywhere. Okay. The old card catalogs just got too cumbersome to manage. So people were looking at ways of doing this automatically. And we have come up as a university in conjunction with other universities around the area, we formed a consortium. And the consortium has a mainframe computer out, outside the beltway, someplace. It doesn't matter where it is. It's electrically connected to our university and AU and a couple other universities. Mm -hmm. And what you can do is you can look up on your uh, PC, you can dial into what we call Aladdin. Okay. And you can select a, a number of databases, ERIC, a database for educational, uh, the ASII database. There's a few databases you can look for references. Mm -hmm. What you'll find is you can find the current holdings in our library, the current holdings in other member libraries. So if I'm trying to order a book uh, that I really need to have for a course, I'll know precisely where that book is and be able to get it. Is That's that right. Correct? For instance, if you wanted to get a book on modern languages and it was at American University, you could find it, get the call number of it, go see our librarian, and she could order the book and have it for you the next day. That's great. Don, there's uh, something I've seen on campus that I'm not really sure of. It's called, the uh, students are talking about, they're called uh, kiosks, uh, and they use them for communication. What, what is that technology? A, a kiosk is an interesting concept. The kiosk is a walk-up booth, kind of like an ATM. And uh, we were very fortunate. IBM went in with us to develop this kiosk notion. A student can walk up there, and if you're not sure what class schedule you've got, you've registered with Touchstone, but you don't know what your schedule is, you can walk up to the kiosk using touch, touch screen. You can ask for your registration, get your class schedule, and you can even print it. Now, if you're a visitor, you can also find some information out about the GW community and local area around, like where you could eat. So it's basically information in a box that you can reach up, go touch, you don't have to know anything about computers. It's touch screen. So you can find information about GW and its environment in one place. Right you, now we have- And you can print it out. And you can print it out. Right now we have three. We think we're going to go to six. 
depends on the demand. If there's a big demand, we'll go to a lot more. Sounds like a good idea. Don, there, there's a concept that's floating around the university uh, that I, I'd like you just to talk about. It's called capital access. What, what does that mean? And what, how does that relate to uh, networking? Well, capital access is a, it's a free net. Now, what that means is this is a, a bulletin board system where you can dial in and chat with other people or get information without having to, to be a registered user and pay fees. Mm -hmm. you, can, you can register with a password and a login and have a mailbox. You can get mail. You can send mail. You can find out about all sorts of things. Now, this particular CAP access has all sorts of things about what's going on in the Washington area. In other I words, see. if you were in town and you wanted to find out what's going on at the Kennedy Center, there's an area we can find out what's going on at the Kennedy Center. Mm -hmm. uh, the government is involved, so if you want to ch check into what's going on at the government, you can pull up the government interest section and do that. This is a, a service that started, I believe, in Detroit, and it spread to L.A. and all over the place. The, the basis of the service is a Sun server, okay. and you, you can dial in on a modem, or you can dial in through the Internet if you're in another location and find out what's going on in D.C. For instance, if I was going to Detroit and I wanted to see if there was an opera in Detroit. I could dial into the Detroit Freenet and find out if there was an opera and what was playing and maybe how I could get tickets. So we thought the concept was pretty good and that DC needed this. So we uh, went together with a, a group called Cap Access. Mm -hmm. We're providing them space and they're providing the management of this now. Now what happens, this is a typical bulletin board where there are interest groups and you get a manager from the community to volunteer his time. And that manager will agree to make sure that the messages on the bulletin boards are all current and that there isn't any profanity. And so it's a monitored message system. Mm -hmm. It sounds like George Washington University has really begun to do some things through its uh, network that w will make a difference for students and faculty and administrators. Um, as you move into the future, is there anything else you can tell us quickly about your strategic management plan for our next venture in the use of networks that will really make a difference to our students? Well, I think one thing we have to be is, if anything, is flexible. Okay. Our, the system we've put in is, is capable of handling any kind of technology that we can attach to it with, with an interface box or a protocol converter or something like that. I can see in the future that we will probably remove the two mainframes that we have, an academic and administrative mainframe, and replace those with minis, which will be much, much smaller. And there's a couple of advantages to this. The new minis are much faster than, than the large mainframes. They take less power and less air conditioning, and they're very easy to manage. They're somewhat like a PC. So the as the technology improves, the technology seems to shrink, and it becomes easier to manage. So and it's much faster and more it's powerful. It's faster, it's easier to work with, it's more user-friendly. And ultimately, it really does contribute significantly to productivity, doesn't it? That's correct. And the next, the next thing we can look at is uh, going with a hospital and sending maybe uh, x-ray images around mm -hmm. for doctors to consult on, to uh, going wireless, perhaps, where it's necessary. For instance, we have a dormitory that's not physically located on campus. But it's close enough to send either an infrared or a radio sped spe spread spectrum radio signal, too. So we could try those technologies out and see how they work. You know, Don, there are many, many technologies that are now cap uh, possible because of the advancing speed and power of computer networks. We want to thank you very much for your presenting some of the important ones here at George Washington University and, and also for your perspective of the future and what's going to happen here. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure. You just uh, raised an interesting question with me, and the question is, uh, do you really need a uh, local area network? And I, I find that question uh, astonishing, because I always thought 
after that with all the things that are occurring in this whole field that everybody needed to have eventually a, a local area network or and everybody should be moving in that direction and now you're raising a question which says do you need it what why would you raise this question now the question really is do you need a local area network or do you just need to be connected to a local area network or to an online service uh, the question really is important because not everyone needs to be connected to a local area network. Every, everyone seems to, to feel that, that once the hype is out there uh, for any product or service that they've got to have it, they've got to be in on it. And that's not necessarily true. In a, in a local area network, you need to look at your, at, at your business requirements. You need to look at all the different phases and factors that, that affect your productivity and efficiency to see if local area networks will help solve the problem, will help you be more productive, more efficient, or more effective. So it's not a foregone conclusion that just because local area networks exist that you have to have one. And there are some, some key points here that you need to look at um, in, in that slide uh, about why you need a local area network. And let's just go over them real briefly. All right. If you're trading floppies a lot, in other words, manually transferring information back and forth between a couple of PCs, uh, you'd be a good candidate to look at to look at a local area network. Um, can you save money by sharing printers and peripherals? You, know, you might be a good candidate for looking at it. Um, D. Buck from the World Bank was talking about uh, one of the biggest things that they, they've got out there is the email that they use uh, and, and voicemail and all the other products. But is, is communications and scheduling uh, an ongoing issue with you? And can you help solve that through the use of local area networks? Multi-user applications, coordinated multi-user applications. You know, can you use that instead of on each individual standalone PC, having it on one PC that everyone shares? You know, a shared database concept. And do you have control over your own destiny? And, and by that I mean, in in a, a historical mainframe environment, you may have the uh, one group responsible uh, for all the program and application development on that on that uh, mainframe, and you're competing for resources between all the different groups and departments in the organization. You know, can you have better control over your own destiny if you have control of the application development within your own group? Harry, I want to I want to go back to the first point, uh, trading floppies. Uh, uh, what's wrong with trading floppies? Nothing's wrong with it, but would it be easier for you to go up and have the the uh, the file located in a common space? for everybody in the organization to access rather than making copies for everyone to use. Um, you know, it's just a question of time. Do you have time to make copies of all these files and then distribute them out to everybody else and then figure out which version is the most current, et cetera, or have it, have it in one location where everyone can have access to it? Of course, if you have a peer-to-peer -peer network and people are working with one type of uh, function in one area and another in another area, they uh, uh, Actually, the files are sort of located all over the place, aren't they? Sort of located all over the place, but you could have, again, you know, one place for that file to exist, whether it's on your PC or my PC. Because as you remember, in a peer-to-peer -peer network, uh, there is no file server, and the applications are distributed among the different PCs, and everybody uh, can have access to them. So you could have a, a user file area on your PC that everyone has access to. It, it, in that question, it was more of, a, more of a time issue. You know, are you spending more time trading floppies rather than being productive, or do you want to just be able to get to a file directly? One of the things that happened in one of the environments that I went into is that they, everybody had their own printer. And they, were, uh, they had a lot of uh, dot matrix printers, and they made a lot of noise. So the first thing they did was to buy uh, soundproofing boxes that they put over them. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but then it took up a lot of space in the office. So the reason that they went to uh, a network was that they could have a, a basically a silent printer someplace in the middle of, of the whole operation, a fairly fast one. And they took away all the uh, dot matrix printers, opened up more space, and claimed that with the purchase of that one single uh, laser printer uh, that uh, five or six people could use, that they really ultimately saved a lot of money. But uh, even though they had to put in uh, network cards and, and uh, tie the, and tie the, uh, sit the computers together. Yeah, the whole issue of uh, you know, are, you, are you more productive or the cost-benefit really has to be weighed when you get into to buying a network. 
uh, and there are a lot of issues uh, that are involved in there. And we're going to get in, into some of those issues when we actually look at a planning model for, for acquiring a local area network. It's also, a, I guess, a question of uh, time versus money, as you, as you just pointed out. If everyone is tied together and you're trying to pull up uh, letters from, uh, on a given person or a client or somebody you want to write to, uh, and you've got your database out there and, and people are sharing that database, it really does make it convenient, uh, particularly if you have to upgrade uh, the database or you have to uh, modify the database or revise it and keep it up to date. Well, I think one, what you just said, convenient and sharing, are probably two very important issues. You know, with with it's convenient to just go up into another uh, another another area to uh, to access a file or to run a program that everybody else in the building has has access to, and you can share that information just as easily with them. And with the new peer-to-peer uh, -peer networks or the client-server architectures that are out there, you know. The, the security really isn't an issue anymore because a lot of them are, are increasing the amount of security that you have in there. So you really designate who you want to have access to something and who you don't. So it really is, you know, like taking out a floppy and running it on the hall and giving it to somebody else, except you eliminate all the time for doing that just by giving them access to your hard drive or to an area on the file server. We well, also ins uh, ensure everybody who's on the network that as uh, changes are made, those that have legitimate reason to make those changes, that everything in the network is updated and, you, and everything is kept up to date. Now, there are some support issues that are involved in that. Uh, you know, as we, as we get down, uh, down the road, uh, you know, those are certainly going to need to be looked at. Well, just one more thing, Barry, related to this, and that is the whole question of, of cost. Um, I think that there's a lot of stress that well, local area networks can really uh, ultimately decrease cost and increase significantly uh, productivity. Uh, I, th I still have some questions about that. I'm not really sure at this time that we have all the enough data to really substantiate those claims. And, I, and I'm hoping that uh, with some of the things that our students do and our viewers out there are doing in terms of this, that they're going to look very hard at that question. Because it may not immediately increase productivity. It may, it may do things better, but it doesn't mean that you're going to be able to produce more. And, and I just think that uh, we, we better all look at that question very hard because there is a front-end cost that's associated with this. Well, there's a front-end cost, just inquiring, acquiring the technology out there, uh, you know, land cards, uh, networking software, cabling, the network operating system. And then there's the, the hidden costs that are out there, which are the support and the ongoing training. And those don't go away. Uh, those continue throughout the life cycle of that local area network. So what we're really saying here, before you make a decision on whether or not you need to land, you better plan not only the emerging and uh, needs that you have, but also you better plan your budget very, very carefully over an extended period of time, uh, maybe even a five-year cycle. Well, let's go over some of the, the steps that you should take in a planning process. Sounds good. Let's do that. The, uh, the next slide. Uh, I've kind of broken it down into seven phases of planning and acquisition of a land. Okay. And, and again, going back to the first point, you really need to, to look at your organization and look at your, one, requirements mm -hmm. to determine if it lends itself to that kind of technology, a local area network technology, to, to assist you in solving your problems. Because remember, a land is just a tool that you're going to use to hopefully make you more effective and efficient. Okay. So the first thing you need to do up front is define your requirements. Well, how, how can we do that, Barry? Well, you need to look at um, what you're doing now and actually what you want to do in the future and what is important to you a as a business. And are you getting those, those, those points done in the business? You know, Barry, if you're in a, let's assume you're in a public school environment. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that you want to do that's never been done before is you want to be able to tie together uh, the instructional program with the library resources. And the only way you can really do that effectively is to, is to have a, a LAN, that, or two LANs really, in wh which you tie together and you can share the necessary databases that will let you look at the resources in one area and, uh, and let the teachers know who are preparing an instructional program precisely what you have and, have, and be, let them be able to access it 
as part of your library resources. All right, but what the danger I don't want anybody to get into is I don't want them to jump to the jump to any conclusions. In the first part of this of this business model is we are defining the requirements. We're not defining any solutions at this point. Okay. All right, so we're going to define the requirements. What are the, are the naked requirements out there to help us to, to better do the job? Then. Uh, w as we go through this, we're going to actually look at all the different tools, and one of those obviously will be a local area network to help us def or solve that problem. So it, it always uh, goes down to looking again, not whether or not you have a network, it's not really the issue. It's precisely what are your needs that are out there, and define those and make sure that those needs are really what what you have that you have to address. Exactly, and you may be targeting a local area network as your solution, but don't let that get mixed up into your business requirements or your requirements. Your requirements should stand alone. This is what I want. Right? This is what I need to have to, to be more efficient and more productive and more effective. And now, um, all right, we know that it's going to lend itself to a little bit more automation. Let's look at our current computing environment. What have I got on hand right now? And so you've got to take an inventory of your hardware and your software and your infrastructure. And by that, I mean your, your telephone capabilities and your, if you have any networking capabilities, uh, any cabling that you have throughout your, throughout your uh, location. Well, very often, um, when I've gone into a setting where they're trying to do uh, automate um, or trying to bring a, a LAN in, they automatically make the assumption that they need a LAN even before they define all their needs. This seems to be a, a, a typical uh, assumption, and mm -hmm. uh, that you know you just sort of do everything at the same time. And what you're really proposing here is that a lot of time be spent up front in trying to de to lay out all of the things that you think you need, as well as to project those kinds of requirements that you're going to be facing as best you can in the immediate future, which might be a year or two years down the line. So you're looking at historical needs. Or, or historical developments, you're looking at current needs, and you're looking at projected requirements as all part of this plan. Right. We've gone over uh, in, the, in the previous session you know, the, the planning model uh, that we'd like the students to, to look at and use. And we've gone over um, in, in previous sessions also uh, assessing information needs. And those all kind of need to dovetail into and be coordinated into any model that you use. Okay. And they're all common sense kinds of things. I need to know what I want first. Then I need to look and see what I have right now. All right now, the next kind of steps that we're dealing here actually say, OK, I think I need a local area network. What do I do now? OK? So we've defined our requirements. We've defined our current computing in environment. Uh, and now we need to go out there and find out what's available. All right, And we need to talk to the vendors. Uh, we need to talk to other people that, uh, that are in a similar situation, other businesses, other um, education institutions, to find out what they're doing to solve this problem. Also, there's a, a growing uh, a whole field of research in this area, isn't there? Mm -hmm. And uh, it wouldn't be a bad idea, as part of uh, what the, they did before they uh, made any decisions, is to really not only talk to vendors, but really do some of the hard research themselves. They could look in ERIC. They can look in some of the other uh, technology databases. They certainly can look in the um, magazines and, and journals that are out there now that, uh, from people that have uh, been ahead in the field in their given areas and, and, yep. and really have said, geez, I really think if you're going to do this, they're the kinds of things you ought to consider when you put your, your planning together for the, for the local area networks. And the reason they have to go to a little bit more uh, detail at this point in the process than they would in, in any other kind of operation is that this field changes so much and so quickly and so rapidly. So they've got to really get up to speed on what's out there available now and what's projected to be out there a little bit later on so that they, they size their solution to, you know, to fit in their organization and project a little bit down the road. Barry, I'm a little concerned about uh, uh, people who are putting together a plan and they sort of, and they say, geez, this is really what, I, this is the best choice I can make, and th this is the amount of money I can spend for, uh, to make it work, and I've talked to the vendors, and this is how I'm going to get started. But you know the dynamic nature of this field says that four or five months down the line, this whole thing is going to change. The, the field will change. We're going to have new technology. They could even be in the middle of an order process 
and find out that there's some really new and exciting speed uh, uh, differential that can occur as a result of a, a, a new board or something like that. Sure. We had that in a recent purchase. but uh, We ordered a product and by the time it actually got delivered, we had gone through two or three or four different changes before we actually got the product in. The product we got in was vastly superior to the one that we originally ordered and it was cheaper. So it, it does change quickly and that's exactly why they need to go out there, talk to the vendors, talk to their colleagues, do some some hard research in the area, find out what's possible. You're really uh, proposing, in effect, that a tremendous amount of careful planning and thinking about current and projected needs be done, and that that precede any of the decisions that would be made on the technology. Is, am I hearing that correctly? I think so. I think you, you have to have a very strong understanding of what you want to do, and mm -hmm. you have to have a strong understanding of what's available out there. And then you need to get together and say, okay, you know, here's what I want, here's what's out there, is there any, anything that meets in the middle here that we can actually think about implementing? I like that strategy much better. There are a lot of people in the field today who are managers, uh, teachers in schools, people who work in universities that simply don't have the technical background, uh, who, who would feel much more comfortable if they realized that what they had to do was to simply sit down and say, these are the needs that I have given my understanding of the field that I'm in. And that as a result of it, as a result of what I have, I then can take this to people who have the technical competencies and I can make it work by telling them, this is what I need. Can you please tell me whether or not the technology as it's emerging and, and how it's coming about will make a difference in helping me to do my job better than I ever did before. Well, I think that that's a key point. One person may not have all the knowledge in the organization to carry through all of these steps. Okay. You know, but it is the planner's job to bring that information together. Not, not necessarily the people. The people don't have to be together, but the information has to be together. That person may have a very great understanding of the requirements in that organization, but they may not have the technical expertise to evaluate what's out there in the field. And, but they need to be able to know the right people or go to the right people to find out that information. One of the, one of the characteristics of this whole planning process is that um, there are times when people will put their needs on paper and, uh, and then one or two people in the organization will talk to the vendors and, and uh, then a purchasing agreement is laid out. Mm -hmm. And then they go ahead with this whole process, and as they begin to implement what's there, they find that there are some significant gaps in how it, it has come together. Uh, I don't like that model very much. The, and one of the models that you and I have talked about in, in planning that seems to make sense is that when, once you're relatively sure what your needs are and your requirements, that it's a good idea to bring together all of the users of, uh, of your system, your LAN, along with the vendors, and to have them come in and go through, uh, go with, talk with each vendor of what their needs are again, because as they begin to talk to vendors and they realize that there are some restrictions in local area networks that they have to face, that it's out of that iteration mm -hmm. with the vendors that they can do a better job of, of shaping their needs, and the vendors can better understand precisely how to satisfy those needs and projected future requirements. Well, that gets a little bit into the next point, design the new network environment from the okay. requirements. Because in designing that new network environment, I think that exactly what you, you've said is true. You, you may need to bring the vendors in and say, OK, here are the end users. Show them what you're, show them what you're proposing here and see if it's going to work. Um, and the end users may say, no, wait a minute. that's that's." that won't work at all, or that's great, it will work perfectly, or can it do this? You know, and work through any incompatibilities in language or technology between the end users and the vendors to be able to come up with a good design for the, for the uh, implementation. Barry, there seems to be some hesitation uh, when people are even putting together small lands about asking a vendor to bring uh, a network right into the setting that they're in, whether it be an office or a school. And uh, I think uh, people who are doing planning have to get beyond that and have to say to vendors if they're going to sell products, bring your product directly into the setting that we're in. 
show us precisely how the hardware and the software that you have works in our setting. Well, if they have any hesitation, they can call you or me and we'll ask them. Oh. Because we have no hesitation in, in doing that whatsoever. Uh, and I think that you're, you're, again, exactly right. They've got to get over uh, the fear that the vendor is the, you know, the, uh, the, the person that's always in the right, uh, the person that is unapproachable uh, out there. They, the, the consumer, the buyer, the planner is the person in charge here. And that planner has to make sure that their solution is going to work. And the only way to do that, because every situation is so unique, is to bring that person in. Bring them in and say, here's my data. Make it work. Here's yeah. my system. Here's my environment. How are you going to do this? Can it do that? You know? Yeah, and if, let's take a school setting for a second. Mm -hmm. uh, they have uh, attendance information that they have to deal with. They might have uh, information on teachers, uh, uh, whereas they would like to notify all teachers at one time about a certain notification. They might have information on holdings in the school. And when you plug all of these into your system and you want to be able to access them correctly and to uh, turn out correspondence, to be able to uh, make changes, to notify parents, to do all the things that are done in schools. Uh, if that can't be demonstrated adequately and it doesn't work, then that's not a system you should deal with. There, uh, Barry, there is something else, and I don't know what your experience uh, is for this, but sometimes one vendor uh, can't give you all the information that you need. Mm -hmm. Uh, so in one case, uh, you, uh, it takes one kind of vendor to help you do the design uh, about, the har about the software mm -hmm. and how the various applications related to the local area network work within, that, w within your LAN. And then there's a whole hardware group, which is totally a, a different group. And sometimes it's very difficult to coordinate uh, those two groups to, make, to come up with a, I won't call it a seamless solution because we don't quite have those yet in many cases. <laughs> yeah, well, what's that? What's yeah, that whatever that means. Uh, but to make sure that as, it's as good as it can be made to solve your problems and not create more problems for you mm -hmm. than before. And uh, in, 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 in a sense, I was being facetious when I asked the question about, you know, why did you even raise the question about do you need a land? But there's another reality here. The reality is that, in many cases, if, it, if the LAN doesn't let you do your job considerably better, not only now but in the future, then you better sort of reevaluate your needs and requirements and hold off until you're sure it will do the job for you. And, uh, and I think that that's really you know, one of the questions. Um, what are some of the other points that you feel, or phases that you feel will really make a difference uh, when you're doing planning for local area networks? Another one is to develop the acquisition and installation plan. Once you've, once you've designed a local area network, you've got to figure out how to buy it. And especially in, a, in an educational environment where we've got so many rules and regulations and can't do's and can do's and you know, this path of, of uh, acquisition, it, it really gets to be a complicated process. You, okay. can't, you can't say, Okay, here's my shopping list. All right, now go out to the to the corner store, buy them all, and bring the guys in that are doing the cabling, and then the next day go in and have everything up and running, and all your all your workstations on your desk and your software installed, and you know, etc. Uh, there are definitely, you know, different avenues that you have to go for for buying different products. Some of them uh, may take longer th than others, uh, and also the installation. The installation is key in any local area network environment. Uh, especially the cabling. The cabling, yeah. I would think, is, you know, it, you can have a car, but if it doesn't have any roads to run on, you're not going to get very far. It's the same way in a local area and network environment. The highways and the bridges and the, and, and the roadways have to be set up properly. And, and, you know, there are a lot of different vendors that go out there and do cabling, but those really aren't the same vendors that, that you use for your network operating system. And those are separate vendors that, uh, that uh, supply you the software. But Barry, for somebody who's really getting just started in this whole business and they think that they want to land and they need to know all the pieces in order to, to consider them for their planning, you, you've mentioned uh, four or five different types of competencies that fit within this. And I just want to take a second and review those. Uh, one type of competency is, uh, is that which you would have to, uh, for your software applications. Mm -hmm. Because you, have, uh, you might have uh, WordPerfect, 
uh, for Windows, and and but it's not in a, it's not the local area network uh, uh, type. So you have to you have to buy that. You have to buy a site license and for the number of users that, that you would have. Uh, or if it's Microsoft Word for Windows, it, it doesn't really matter. You you have to take that into consideration. And then you have a, a software that you have to buy that, that within the LAN. It could uh, and it could be uh, Novell. It could be Microsoft Word, uh, Microsoft uh, uh, LAN product. Uh, it could be NT. Mm -hmm. as we're beginning uh, to find out is really important, and a lot of other vendors that are out there right. who, who sell uh, those kind of products. Um, then you have uh, the hardware vendors that, uh, that really will help you once you get the software done, which is obviously the first step. So it's needs, requirements, then your uh, software, all the software involved, and then obviously your hardware. And, and then there are a lot of other questions that you're now raising have to be asked in terms of how this is going to be uh, wired. And so then you talk to a totally different type of vendor who then says, well, uh, if you're going to run 10Base uh, T, uh, this is, uh, you know, maybe you can, yeah, you can still use a twisted pair if you don't, if you're not going up to 100 megabits or whatever the right. technology piece is. Whatever and, the lingo is. And, and you say, oh my goodness, what are you talking about? And, and uh, but that's another competency. But for our people who really don't have all those competency, competencies, um, how can they get up to snuff rather quickly and still do the kind of design that makes sense? I guess that's the hard question. Well, there, there are really two answers that come quickly to mind here. One is don't get up to speed, and ha but, but buy someone who is up to speed, okay. who does this for a living, uh, you know, like a, a, a network integrator okay. that takes all these different components and has done this any number of times and, and puts it all together for you. Uh, another solution that comes quickly to mind is model yours after someone who's already successfully done it. Talk to somebody who's actually done it before mm -hmm. and use uh, some of the ideas and strategies and developmental pieces that they've had. Exactly. That makes sense. You know, or you, it, the smaller the local area network, the more you can pretty much rely on, on the vendors themselves to, to help to help you judge that. But as the scale increases, when you get to the more complex lands or the larger lands, uh, probably one of those two routes uh, would be a good, good way to go. And certainly if you're hooking together 50 or 100 different offices and, and all the local area networks are all separate but have to be hooked together for common decision making, common data sharing, then it's certainly not the kind of thing that you would want to, to do yourself. I wouldn't want to do it myself. I see. But there are, there are a number of issues involved once you get outside of the physical office uh, that you need to be aware of. You know, how, do you, how do you connect to another office? Uh, you know, what, is, what, is, what devices, hardware devices do you need? What's the latest devices that, that you need? What kind of speed do you need uh, to connect uh, between offices? And there are a lot, there are a lot of issues as you, as you grow bigger and bigger that, uh, that you need to learn, learn how to do or learn uh, how to ask the right questions. Barry, let's assume that I get to a, a, to a point where I develop a successful plan, be it acquisition, installation, or just a series of recommendations that I need to take to put a, land, a local area network online. Am I going to have to be trained to use this, or can I sort of play with it and uh, follow the directions in the new manuals and make it all work correctly? Well, I, I shudder to think if we didn't teach you how to drive and you just had to rely on the manual, how to do it. Uh, it it's a lot like, a lot like uh, learning how to drive a car. It, it really helps to have someone with you to teach you how to do uh, all the, the various idiosyncrasies of, of uh, learning to drive a car, the same way with a local area network. You need to have a very comprehensive training program in place. You need to have someone there who is going to administer that land for you. Now again, we're, we're talking, talking scale here. You may not need as much of a uh, of a training and uh, systems administrative methodology if you're only talking about a, a three or a four user LAN. Right. But as you get more and more users up on the LAN, the training and uh, systems administrative um, functions become more complex and more demanding on your time. So you need to figure out for training, am I going to do video-based training? Am I going to send someone to take a class? Am I just going to uh, give them the book and have them go at it? Am I going to bring someone in to train them? Uh, am I going to send them uh, to partnership with another company or something and have them go over there and learn how to do it? Well, 
I guess one more point, Barry, that uh, you mentioned here is to install everything, test it, and, and train the users. I, I would like to just comment on that very quickly before we go into barriers. And that is that I'm a firm believer that you don't pay the final piece of your contract with a vendor or vendors until it all works. What's your sense of that? I agree. And the, and the nice thing about having a network integrator yeah. is that he's responsible for making it work and you're not. So you can have he be the one who figures out all the problems, gets all the pieces to work together to, to actually come to, a, to, to some kind of satisfactory conclusion. Um, you know, that's the most important part is the end piece and getting it to working properly at the end. If you do your planning up front, if you do it thoroughly, I think that you will eventually get to a successful implementation. Appreciate that. Well, Barry, you, uh, you, you've come up with uh, seven key points that are the greatest barriers to networking. And to finalize our show today, uh, could you tell us a little bit about these? The, the first one is, com is complexity. Uh, as we were talking about a little bit before, you know, there are just so many products out there. Uh, hard software products, uh, hardware products, uh, telecommunications issues that, that are just inundated the industry and it really is hard to figure out and pick and choose which one to use to get them to all work together properly. <laughs> and, and if you don't find the right products that work harmoniously together, then you're going to have some false starts before you actually get a successful implementation. And no one wants, no one wants that to happen. Are there a, a, a lot of different standards for networks uh, that make it difficult to uh, connect one type of network with another? Well, remember D. Buck you know, from the World Bank. Uh, if, he had to, if he could change one thing about the networking industry, it would have been developing a consistent set of standards out there. And right now, there really aren't any. So you're kind of taking your best guess as to where the industry is going to be heading five to ten years from now to be able to, to, to make it work. And if you guess wrong, then you've got to do some shifting when, when a standard does emerge. Well, you, you change your uh, hardware and software and, uh, and you put on new hardware and software. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, yeah, and that's all. That's that, all. No problem. No problem. <laughs> well, uh, the, the idea of lack of expertise is a very interesting one to me because uh, uh, nobody is an expert anymore in these fields. I, if you claim you're an expert, then there's really something wrong with you. Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, the field changes daily. Uh, well, and you can't be an expert on everything. Like you said, uh, you, you, can be, you can be an expert in, in understanding your requirements. You can be an expert in a piece of software or multiple pieces of software. Right. You can be in the, an expert on a piece of hardware or multiple pieces of hardware. But remember, we've got so much stuff out there that can be connected to LANs uh, you know, faxes, uh, scanners, uh, CD-ROMs, uh, PCs, uh, you know, you name it, it's out there. To be an expert is just incredible these days. Well, somebody told me that there's uh, two types of commitment for lands or, or, or this whole field. One type is, uh, is what we call current commitment, and the other is long-term commitment. And long-term commitment means that you have to lock up your budget in the future more than just for a, uh, a single year in some cases because you're really looking at a five-year projection. This is a pretty difficult thing mm -hmm. because it, it also means that you've got to pr have a fairly good sense of what it's going to cost you in the future. And uh, that's very difficult these days. Well, commitment in, in the long term for, for anything uh, because of, of all the different variables involved in, in a business is a very hard thing uh, to deal with. And having that commitment up front I think is very important to make it go throughout the whole process. Barry, the last point that uh, you mentioned is the lack of products. And uh, if we could just have something uh, that would really give us a, a sense very quickly on that, what would it be? Well, lack of products, I guess, uh, what I was talking about there is also what Deepak was saying about the integration between the mainframes and, and the lands. And we kind of kiddingly said uh, a seamless integration that really isn't there yet, but I think it will be down the road. Barry, these uh, barriers look to be the kinds of things that uh, we're going to face right now. We're going to face uh, in the future. Certainly the politics of, of uh, local area networks are very important because there's uh, more than one person involved. In fact, there could be multiple offices and sharing of data and information 
is, uh, is very, very much a difficult thing for us to have. Uh, Barry, I, uh, I really think that you've uh, given us some good points to think about in discussing the barriers. Um, and it's something that all of us will take into consideration as we carry out our planning. And uh, we really do appreciate um, these ideas uh, and how we can better consider planning. Thank so, you. Thank you very much, Barry. Thank you.